वाते करण करे हेलो मिस्टर अंबेडकर आ कोई छे नहीं बस वो दो Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our speaker will be joining the meeting in another five minutes. So as soon as she joins the session, we'll start with today's session.
she has joined. Uh, Miss Rishti, Miss Rishti, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah I oh. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shall we start with the session? Yes, we can do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, one and all present here. A uh, hearty welcome to all, all of you, for the day three session of six day workshop of machine learning and its application. Today, uh, we have Ms. Rishti Gautam as our session speaker. Uh, here is a brief introduction to Ms. Rishti. She is a PhD scholar at Arctic University of Norway, Norway Tromsø. She did her bachelor's in computer science and engineering from Kurukshetra University. After completing her graduation in 2014, she went on to work in Aspiring Minds as a software developer. Later, she quit her job and started her machine learning journey in IIT Mandi in 2015 as a MS by research student. She worked on cervical cancer research as a part of her degree, simultaneously collaborating with Aintra Private Limited. Following this, she worked in a few companies focusing on machine learning in healthcare, which eventually led uh, her to pursue a PhD in Tromso in machine learning in medical images. So we are very happy to have you here, Ms. Rishti Gautam, as one of our session speaker. Um, a hearty welcome to you to the six day workshop. And uh, it's all here, over to you to begin with the today's session. Thank you so much for that kind welcome. I'm really uh, honored to be here. I will share my screen now. Yeah, sure. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, can you see the um, presentation? Yeah, 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 we okay, can see. Perfect. Okay. okay, and uh, one small request, if, if it is possible to a little louder, it will be helpful because okay. the audio okay. is uh, not very much not clear. Not so loud? Okay. Yeah, okay. now it's okay. Now it's better. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's better. I adjusted my earphones. Yeah. Okay, okay nice. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Srishti and I'm going to tell you some stuff about machine learning and uh, basically how to apply it in the medical domain. So I know the past two sessions have been uh, basically more practical. Uh, this session will be more theoretical and you will get to know how a problem is solved eventually uh, using machine learning, especially in the medical domain. Um, if I'm going fast in between or if I'm not clear, anybody please interrupt me if you have any questions please let me know i will be really glad to answer any of the questions okay so let's start yeah so i thought why not start with something about me that why did i chose to be to do machine learning and uh, the second more important question why did i choose to work with the medical data so to be honest with you guys, uh, I started doing machine learning um, as was said in my introduction when I started my master's in IIT Mandi. And machine learning I did was because, you know, machine learning, everybody's doing it. But why the medical data? So I, when I joined um, IIT Mandi, I was given a choice between different types of projects I can work on. So for example, one of them was the bird uh, sound classification. So you know, in the in a place like Mandi in Himachal, there are many birds and uh, the people there are working on um, automatically uh, classifying the birds based on their sounds. And they are collecting the data in real time as well there. So that's that's also very interesting. 
and uh, the second one was the uh, basically the medical data project uh, which was depending on cervical cancer data set and um, I always actually wanted to take biology when I was in high school, but I never got to do it. So I thought, why not just combine computers and medical data and go ahead with the cervical cancer research? Um, okay. So the big question that was in my mind and that is in everybody's minds is, can we actually really solve medical problems with machine learning? Uh, the answer is, no um but yeah at least not yet so what can we do to do this what why are we using machine learning if we cannot really solve the medical problems what we can really do is actually help the medical professionals so we cannot uh diagnose totally the cancer or brain tumor on the on behalf of them but we can help them see that oh maybe there is something different in this slide in this mri image in this cancerous uh, in this uh, microscopic image so maybe it would be better uh, if the doctor looks at them so that is why we are actually doing the machine learning stuff and what is going behind in the machine learning stuff. Uh, yeah, I will give you a few examples uh, uh, what happens um, when we apply the machine learning. So one of the example is like I told you cervical cancer screening. So this is a, a microscopic, this is called as bright field microscopic slide in which um, the cells are uh, studied under a microscope and the colors that you see here are basically a different type of staining which helps us to see the cells better uh, in general the cells have no color they are colorless they are in gray color so um, as you can see uh, here there are some black uh, huge dots i would say these are the nuclei this in the background there are some small nuclei um but when there are small nuclei the cells are bigger and when there are big nuclei the cells are smaller more compact so these are actually the abnormal cells they are the cancerous cells and the ones in the background here they are all the normal cells they are also called as squamous epithelial cells if anybody anybody wants to learn about them um and there are some black dots here for example this this is not a cell but this is a debris which also looks like a nuclear so um what happens in general life is a doctor or a technician looks at these slides uh, under the microscope and they see that oh there are some abnormal cells here basically they also generally count how many abnormal cells are there they report everything in uh, from this and they forward it to the doctor and say okay you might need to look at this slide and at the at this person's profile and see what we can do um and this is what we are doing with machine learning also in this image we try to find out that oh there are some abnormal cells maybe we should forward it to the technician to double check it or maybe we can uh, forward it directly to the doctor and say our artificial intelligence has found an abnormality maybe it would be really good if the doctor looks at it uh, the second example is also really good. It is uh, about the diabetic retinopathy. So um, diabetic retinopathy is a disease which happens in the eyes. Uh, so these are basically uh, images of eyes. Uh, these are called as fundus images, uh, F-U-N-D-U-S, fundus. And um, so because of uh, diabetes, there are some abnormalities happening in the eyes. So as you can see on the left side, there is a normal retina. Um, and on the right side, there is a diabetic retina. 
and because of this actually what happens is people uh, can lose their sight and many other complications can happen so it's really good to um, analyze this so as you can see in the diabetic retina there are some abnormalities in the this yellow part we call them as yellow lesions uh, whenever there is an abnormality we call call it as lesion basically and uh, you can see here there are some red dots we call them as red lesions and um, although these are the blood vessels that are going uh, so although they are looking normal but they are not uh, they are they have some specific properties for example this one this one is abnormal uh, it is becoming a little transparent uh, and this is called as a cloud yellow cloud this is also an abnormality so we have to find this all of these abnormalities in the image uh, and which can help us diagnose uh, if the person has diabetic retinopathy or not um, and what we want to do is we want to um, if you say it in general terms we want to read these images uh, in a, read these images on a computer and pass them on to a CNN or anything and which can classify if this has something or not. But it actually looks uh, very easy, but when you go and try to implement it, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, so one of the example can be that uh, for example, the yellow lesions. So there is a number. So uh, in the yellow lesions, if there is say two or four yellow lesions then people say that it's a normal retina but if they are there are more than 20 then it is an uh, abnormal retina which has diabetes so when you pass this on to uh, a cnn it can detect that there is abnormality here but how can it detect that how many yellow lesions are there and that is the hardest part uh, of this uh, analysis uh, one other example can be urine sediment analysis. So when you uh, take a microscopic image of urine, uh, this is also bright field microscopy, you will see a lot of different kinds of cells. So this is these are red blood cells, these are white blood cells, this is yeast, there are some, this is a crystal. So uh, what happens is, um, uh, so uh, when a person, uh, a technician looks at this, they actually count the red blood cells, white blood cells, so they can tell if there, if there is any problem by counting the number of cells. So this is also another uh, machine learning problem which can be solved. And also the very famous MRI segmentation. So uh, in the MRI segmentation, so as you can see here, this part had to be segmented here. It is mentioned as GT, which is called as the ground truth. So this part had to be segmented. Um, so the segmentation in MRI can be related to tumors or it can be um, related to segmenting just different parts of the brain for people to see that uh, for the medical professionals or non, not so much medical professionals to see what is happening inside the brain. And this is actually very, very interesting, which I find personally find very interesting. Um, okay, so now that you have some idea about the medical applications, I am going to show you a particular application and how um, it can be solved from starting to the end. So this is the cervical cancer screening using machine learning. This is the work that I did in IIT Mandi. Um, okay, let's go. This is the basic outline of the system. I am going to tell you about uh, cervical cancer, what it is, how it can be diagnosed, what to look for. Then I'm going to tell you about. So the basic problem in machine learning can be um, divided into two parts. Um, so first step is generally segmentation and second is and final step as you all know, is the classification. So I'm going to take you to both of these parts and then I'm going to show you the fully automated system. 
Okay, what is cervical cancer? It is actually the second most common cancer worldwide. Just a second. Yep, better. So this is the second most common cancer worldwide. And uh, as you can see down here um, in the footer, there is uh, an article linked by Times of India, which actually mentioned cervical cancer back as top killer among women. This was in 2016. And unfortunately, the situation is still the same. And uh, cervical cancer is second most common. The first most common is breast cancer, uh, on which also many, many people are working in India and in all over the world for uh, especially in the field of machine learning. So um, in the cervical cancer, it's so uh, devastating that actually half a million new cases appear every day. And 86% uh, deaths happen in developing countries. And that's why it is actually more important to study the this in a country like India. Um, so, and 24% uh, of the total cancer related deaths of women in India was because of cervical cancer, and that is really, really concerning. So, um, what happens in cervical cancer, and how can you screen them? How can you screen the cervical cancer? So, um, the, the cells of cervical cancer actually take up to a decade to turn into the cancerous ones. So there is a silver lining. So in these 10 years, if cervical cancer is detected, then it is curable. And that is really good news. And that is what people are doing. And uh, what I've seen also in uh, other countries is every th three years, it is compulsory for women to uh get a checkup for cervical cancer and i think it should be mandatory in uh, india also but it's not but i really um urge every woman attending this uh presentation to please go to the doctor regularly every th three years and get yourself checked uh yeah the silver lining is can be fully cured if detected early and how can it be detected? It is detected through a test called as the apnea test, and it is the most common test. And uh, especially why it is used is because it's so cheap, and it can, it is it can be afforded by anybody, and that's the best thing about this. So, um, for our machine learning model, also we are going to use the um, slides from the pap smear test. There is another test um, based on liquid uh, cytology, which gives us better cells, but it is very expensive and uh, so it's not a good solution at all. So this is also one more thing to look at when you uh, propose the machine learning solutions is to uh, say that you're always working uh, to improve the cheapest solutions, more economic solutions. Challenges are that the cellular material in the pap smear test, these are the pap smear test challenges. The cellular material is unevenly distributed or regions are too dense or overlapping cells. So I will show you again here. So for example, the cells are uh occluded occluded means uh they are not visible uh, or an object is occluded when it is not clearly visible it is hidden by another object so these cells are actually hiding some of the cells beneath them and uh, they are grouped together so it's really hard to study them by the machine learning algorithm and um as you can see this uh the this is the cytoplasm as we all know um, behind the nuclei and in that there is a chromatin pattern and that chromatin pattern is basically um, made of proteins and when there is a normal cell the chromatin pattern is generally more or less uh, homogeneous uh, very well spread in whole of the image but when it's an, an abnormal cell 
uh, it can be more concentrated at some place let's concentrate it in some other places which uh, is also one of the big challenges while making the machine learning algorithm so yeah regions there are, you saw some regions which are extremely dense and extremely overlapping so uh, this is really bad for uh, the reliable interpretation uh, this is a normal pap smear analysis how it's done is a brush i would say uh, is uh, inserted into the cervix and a sample is taken which is applied on a glass slide as you can see in step three and then in the step four which is the really really important step is that uh, staining is done and staining is done to differentiate uh, different types of cells so and after that this is um, analyzed uh, by the doctors uh, from the microscope and uh, how we analyze them is the microscopes generally have a very good camera and they capture the images um, and these images are the ones that we analyze so why the automated screening why uh, what is the need of automation here um, so uh, there are some when the cells turn into uh, the from normal cells to the precancerous or cancerous cells there are some changes happening which we call as morphological changes uh, in the morphological changes uh, what happens uh, morphology is basically about the size and shape of an object so their overall morphology is changing and what is happening is in an abnormal cell the nucleus size increases and um the as i showed you the distribution of chromatin pattern which is in the cytoplasm which is basically the background of a cell it becomes more irregular and the cytoplasm actually becomes very very small and nucleus size increases so if you see these three points how actually it is done right now in the hospitals is uh, they see the nucleus they see the cytoplasm they calculate the ratio of nucleus to the cytoplasm if it is extremely high um, then it is an abnormal cell it is if it is extremely low then it is an uh, normal cell so while uh, people look at these changes manual screening is not so good because it demands labor requirements and the people can be can get um, tired and also it is expensive because obviously you have to pay the labor to do this stuff uh, so what um, happens is actually uh, it is also very sad but it can happen that a person uh, can be looking at a hundred slides per minute so imagine you're looking at a hundred slides maybe you're missing something and also there are many discrepancies when you go from inter observer to intra observer for example a person seeing that uh, there is a cancer if he sees that cell again he might change his mind because he's a person people can ch change their minds but if it's a machine if it's a machine learning algorithm it will not change its mind and that is the best thing about artificial intelligence it is um, it does not have human opinion in them not yet at least okay so when we do the automation it's good because uh, it has lower cost we don't use so much of labor and definitely it has a speed up and uh, definitely an accuracy which can be measured which cannot be measured in terms of the human um, <clears throat> screening okay so um, so actually what uh, was happening until now in this case was people were as I told you people were looking for 
cytoplasm as well as nucleus to decide if the cell has cancer or not. But in this uh, study, we proposed to only look at the nuclei and not look at the cytoplasm. And why was that happening? Is because um, when you segment the nuclei is definitely more reliable because the cytoplasm is overlapping, occluded or grouped. So these are normal and abnormal cells. Uh, as you can see, left side is normal cell and these cells are pretty much good to segment out. Uh, but in the abnormal cells, can you see their boundaries? Because I cannot. Can you see the cytoplasm? Because I cannot. And that's why it's always better to segment the nuclei. Um, also, uh, so below you will see an example of single cells. So these are just the cells from the whole slide images that are sh uh, showing above. Um, these are just from different data sets, which I'll also I will explain later. Um, so in the normal cell, the nuclei is small but visible. In the abnormal cell, the nuclei is big, uh, also visible. And it's shown that only the nucleus-based features can be extremely valuable and effective in many of the literature. Um, as you, so can you see the difference between normal nuclei and abnormal nuclei? It is there. The normal nuclei is more round. It is more homogeneous. It is more smooth. While the abnormal nuclei is definitely not round, and the chromatin pattern inside the nuclei is also very non homogeneous. There are some dark parts, there are some non dark parts. So, even if we can uh, differentiate between a normal and abnormal nuclei, that will be uh, very helpful for the overall diagnosis. Um, this is the overall pipeline that is used for the uh, cervical cancer diagnosis. I would suggest you to block the everything that is written inside the yellow part here because it's too much for right now. So if we just look at just the outside, so there's an input image, then there are three steps. The first one is detection, the second is segmentation, Third is classification, which finally tells us whether it is a normal nuclei or it is an abnormal nuclei. So in the detection, so there are two similar but not so similar things. One is detection, the other is segmentation. Uh, these are just the, again, machine learning approaches. So in detection, what happens is it does not, it tells that, oh, there is a cell here. In the whole slide image, there can be a cell here, as you can see here, uh, up where it's written cell detection. It says, oh, there is a cell here. Uh, so in the whole slide image there, or it can say that there is a nuclei here. So if you run a nuclei detection algorithm or a cell detection algorithm, it will say that this area might contain some nuclei. But when you want to do the segmentation, it will further go inside the detected cell and segment. It will say that this part is the nuclei specifically. In the abnormal cell, it will say this part is the nuclei. And finally, the classification. Um, also in the classification, there can be traditional approaches as were, were very famous were SVMs and random forests. Uh, SVMs are support vector machines, uh, which I hope you all know. And random forests are decision tree based uh, things. And after that, CNNs came into play and actually put everything down. So uh, the modern approaches consists of um, maybe direct classification or using transfer learning or many things, which I will tell you later. And finally, it will tell if the cell is normal or abnormal. Also, uh, I want to mention here that it's actually extremely important um, to um, not have any 
true negatives i would say in the overall classification so what i'm uh, saying is that even so when a cell is abnormal and you classify it as normal that should not be allowed when you're working with uh, medical images so you should design your classifiers in such a way that all the abnormal cells are classified as abnormal cells and it can have some normal cells classified as abnormal cells but never the other way around never abnormal cells classified as normal cells this you can imagine this can be really hazardous to the person's life uh, and when the all the results are passed on to the doctors they can uh, eventually classify oh that this is not normal it's okay i will just focus on the abnormal cells so that is extremely extremely important okay so going further i will show you a uh, unsupervised segmentation algorithm uh, what do i mean by seg unsupervised so you know supervised and su unsupervised uh, methods i hope i will just repeat uh, in the supervised methods what happens is we imagine we have ground truth available we have given that uh there is in the segmentation case especially what happens is it will say that oh there's a cell here and it is marked by the re red boundary um and we can use that in our segmentation algorithm and in the unsupervised segmentations we actually don't use anything we imagine we have no ground truth available we have just the cells and we have to segment them so this is the overall procedure uh, which i will go step by step and then come back to this figure and tell you so the first step is actually pre-processing uh, that we say uh, which is very also very important in image processing uh, to get a better segmentation or better classification pre-processing is extremely important so what happens uh, is they uh, on the left side are were my original images on the right side are my pre-processed images what i am actually doing in this complicated algorithm is shown here um so on the top when you see two graphs the original image actually had a graph uh, sorry the histogram like this and all the values were concentrated only at uh, the middle part and the values of an image you know range from may range from 0 to 255 but they are just taking the values here so what if we just expand this histogram to fill the whole region and when you do that it shows that it has a better contrast it has a darker nuclei it has a lighter background which is very important for segmentation in the following steps so this is what this uh, pre-processing step is doing this is also very very common in many literature you will see many pre-processings happening and i will also suggest to you when you are making a machine learning algorithm um, even if you are using a cnn and not using traditional methods look for some pre-processing which will actually help the cnn to uh, perform even better so okay on this pre-process cells what we do is we uh, do the mean shift segmentation and uh, i don't think i should go in so much detail of mean shift segmentation but um i will show you the results of the paper um okay so here um this is actually the mean shift paper this is just a method for segmentation which was proposed some time back uh, in a very good um, conference so uh, i will show you some results so this is actually the mean shift segmentation uh, these are the pixel values and eventually mean shift segmentation what it does is it will uh, make some clusters and make some partitions in the data and say, okay, this, this is one class, this is another class, this is another class. 
And how it does that is by making a density distribution of the data and finding the maximum region. So you can see there are the maximas here and it will say, okay, this is all the pixels containing this color are uh, one, uh, containing this color are one cluster. All the pixels containing this color are another cluster. And that is what actually mean shift segmentation does. And it's really extremely, extremely interesting. And if you look at the results, yes, extremely good results. You will see here that on the left, uh, they are, there are original images. And then they are just increasing some parameters to get different types of segmentation. And when you increase it too much, uh, then, yeah, this is 32 comma 16 and increase it too much. Many, many things are merging and becoming one cluster. So this is the clustering algorithm. Now we go back to our slides. Uh, yeah, so this is just a gradient estimation. And um, the important thing about mean shift segmentation is it not only takes the color of the pixels, it also takes their location. Where are they located? If they are located together and they end, if they have the same color, they definitely belong to the same cluster, right? Uh, okay. So what we did here was we took the simple mean shift segmentation and made it adaptive. Adaptive as in it will change with every... Uh, general mean shift segmentation is uh, same for all of the input data what we did was uh, to change it to make it more robust to change it with the input data and for that we just multiplied our um, window i would say in the mean shift segmentation which is a parameter in the mean shift segmentation we changed it by um, making this contrast based adaptiveness. And this is just the standard deviation of the image divided by normalized by the all the standard maximum of the standard deviation of all of the images, so, training images, I would say. So in this one, uh, you will see if uh, an image has a higher contrast, it will get a more big window. If it has a lower contrast, it will get a smaller window. And that's really helpful, as you will see later. Uh, uh, another segmentation algorithm you can re read about or you might already know about is SLIC. And it is actually um, it is sim simple linear iterative clustering, and uh, it is, I would say, mostly based on k-means, um, which, and here it takes the lab color space. So there are, you know, different color spaces in images. One is R RGB color space. You can transform it into HSV color space, or you can transform it into lab color space. So uh, SLIC takes the value in the lab color space and just performs some distance, find some distance between the pixels and that's how it performs its clustering. And here also we are doing the same adaptiveness where CI is our same uh, adaptive parameter. Okay, these are extremely really interesting results. Uh, so, just follow me here. I don't get overwhelmed by looking at everything. Uh, so the first column uh, are the original images. And you can see the top one has a uh, higher contrast. That means that it is the nucleus is actually visible and more clear, uh, more different than the background. Hmm. And the lower image has a lower background and um, um, sorry, lower contrast and the nuclei is actually very similar to the background. So first on these images, we apply our uh, pre-processing and these are the results, very good results. Then we apply mean shift uh, algorithm and in C and I step. And here we are using a common mean shift algorithm with constant um, parameters. And in that you can see that the, the 
mean shift was actually performing good for the image with the higher contrast but with the lower contrast it is actually merging the nuclei with the background and hence it is merging it with another nuclei so on the bottom there is another nuclei but in this uh, step we only want to focus on the nuclei which is present in between uh, of the image in the middle of the image but when we do the mean shift with adaptive um, bandwidth you can see in d and j that actually it helps a lot and it uh, will not um, merge the nuclei with the background so in the adaptive bandwidth you can see for the higher contrast image hr was higher which was 17.6 and for the lower contrast image hr was 12.5 which is actually what we want and it was really really helpful and finally, the last two rows are the SLIC um, data results. And this is the SLIC, which is actually not performing so good, but we should, uh, there's a saying in machine learning, which is that uh, results, any kind of results are good, even if they're bad or good, yeah, but results are good so because you get to learn with them uh, so slic is not performing that good so you can see this is the original slic and when you do the adaptive like regularization uh, it is also merging with the background here it was also merging with the background before so good learning then um, after doing the segmentation pre-processing and segmentation now we want to do some thresholding thresholding means we just want to say that okay these pixels are the nuclear these pixels are the nuclear and for that what uh, i have done here is that you will see that this was the original histogram of the image after the mean shift segmentation and we modify the histogram because there is one uh, big reason in machine learning you also go through with a lot of analysis so the analysis here shows that the nuclei are generally darker right they are the dark part of the images and that is what we want so we modified the histogram to make it uh, to multiply it with an exponential function exponential distribution which uh, which would be like this so the exponential distribution will give more um, importance to the darker the zero darker pixels uh, the values corresponding to zeros for example and it will give low weightage to the uh, pixels um, having for example value as 255 and then we apply a thresholding called as also thresholding which just finds an optimum threshold in this histogram uh, so and when we did that the results were like this as shown these are the thresholded images and uh okay so uh, if you go through row one first is our original image then the pre-processed image then the segmented image and d is our thresholded image image but when we use a normal also threshold on a normal histogram on the original histogram this was the result which was really really bizarre and it was not paying attention to the darker parts of the image uh, the same result you can see in row two where i and in i and j you can see that there's a huge difference and same the last part you can see in n and o so this thresholding is actually being a playing a very huge role okay this is a very important slide because this is about the data set that was used in this uh, study so this is called as herlef pap smear data set and it is publicly available so if anybody wants to perform any experiments on their own to see uh anything yeah please go to this link mentioned and uh, download the data set and look for yourself uh, so there are seven classes in this three of them are normal and four of them are abnormal here i have arranged them in the increasing order of their normality uh, abnormality 
So the left one is the most normal image and the right one is the most abnormal image, which is the carcinoma. Uh, these were the results. So the, um, I will just tell you about the F score. So with the mean shift algorithm, the F average F score was 0 0.86. With the SLIC, it was 0 0.85. And with FCM, which is actually a state of the art, it was 0 0.84. So we were performing better. And finally, if uh, you use mean shift and also with the original one and non adaptive the, uh, and uh, the results are actually 0 0.64, which is really, really bad. So adaptiveness is really helping here. And yeah, that's it for segmentation using traditional method. Now, very important, segmentation using CNNs, which everybody wants to know how. So um, right now, I would tell you there are some um, architectures which actually segment the whole image, which are called as fully convolution networks. Uh, but we are using a normal CNN and we are uh, using a patch based approach. So what we are doing in that is very interesting uh, and very easy and it gives extremely good results. Uh, so we take the original image. We, as I told you about homogeneity, so the homogeneity of a nuclei in the normal cell is uh, less because it has more de detail in the nuclei while the normal uh, cell has very normal nuclei. So uh, we actually managed to separate them on the basis of homogeneity. And we said that the uh, abnormal cells don't need any pre-processing and the normal cells need pre-processing. And we finally designed two CNNs, separate CNNs, one without pre-processing, we trained it with all the data one is with pre-processing, we trained it again with all the data. And uh, we would, in the test um, test scenario, an image would come, it would divide into, it, if it goes to CNN without pre-processing or if it goes to CNN with pre-processing and then it will be segmented out. Why we did that, uh, I will tell you, uh, yeah. So you can see this is an abnormal cell. When, this is the abnormal nuclei. You can see there are many, many things inside the cell. And when you do a pre-processing, those are highlighted. And when you do the segmentation, the segmentation will be based around them and not the whole nuclei, which is definitely not what we want. But when you do the same thing in the normal cell, which has a homogeneous nuclei, uh, and when you do the pre-processing, it is even better. It, is ha it has a better contrast. It is more visible. So we calculate the homogeneity of the full cell and then we select the threshold. This is again um, the pre-processing that we used in the last step. This is again the same pre-processing. We do this. Um, we, okay, how the patch-based CNN works, this is now uh, important. So um, in the patch-based CNN, uh, the segmentation problem actually is converted into a classification problem. So a patch is taken around every pixel and the patch can be of any size. Here we took 31 cross 31. So at every pixel, we took a patch of size 31 cross 31. And if you have, if you are having the questions about uh, what about the corner pixels? Actually, we did not use the corner pixels in this one because um, thankfully our nuclei lies in the center of the image. But if you want to use them, there are many ways you can mirror the image to be of more uh, bigger size and then take the corner pixels or many other different ways. Uh, then we did the three class classification problems. So, so we are not actually only classifying if the patch is a nucleus or a background. We actually wanted to classify if it's an edge because it definitely gives better result. Uh, as you might imagine the edge pixel might have different features than the nucleus and the background. Uh, 
Then we just trained the two CNNs and we had uh, 1 lakh 48,000 patches for training and 46,000 patches for validation. Uh, we used VGNet like architecture, as you can see here. And uh, we used dropouts for regularization and we also used patch normalization. And these were the results. So eventually, um, the proposed segmentation uh, proposed segmentation was given a 0 0.90 f-score, which is way higher than mean shift in the previous approach. But also, you see that this is a supervised algorithm. The previous one was an unsupervised algorithm. So there is always a mm, difference there in unsupervised and unsupervised algorithms. And when we did no pre-processing, the result was 0 0.77. When we did pre-processing on all of the images, it was 0 0.82. And uh, to show the importance of three class classification, we also did two class classification and it was given zero, only 0 0.63. Now, uh, these were the results which look very, very nice. I think so on the last uh, column, these are the ground truths actually. And last second is our segmentation, which is extremely close and very good. Okay, now we are done with the segmentation things. We move on to classification. Classification, as I told you, can be done in two steps. There can, it can be done in traditional way using uh, finding the features and classifying using SVMs, random forests, or any other classifier LDAs or something. Or we can use the deep learning approach, which everybody wants to use now. So uh, feature extraction, we actually, because as I already told you, the nuclear, nucleus is extremely different in uh, terms of in normal and abnormal cells in terms of morphology. So we thought uh, the normal handcrafted features can be based on mean, variance, homogeneity, area, perimeter, anti-circularity. And we also took some 966 other features, which are uh, different variants of texture, shape, and size from another uh, literature. And we used SVMs and random forests. So so when we did that, you can see that um, with the ground truth segmentation, when you use six features and SVM, it was 64.99. And with our segmentation, it was 57.87. And as you move forward, yeah, with random forest and uh, maybe SVM. Um, random forest and, okay, let's take 966 features and it says 67.77%. And with our segmentation, it was 62.30%. So it actually shows that our segmentation was very close to the ground truth segmentation. Now, um, that is um, this thing which I'm going to skip. Yeah, I'm straight going to the CNN classification and it's extremely interesting to see the results of this one. So this is a normal AlexNet. What we did was we took the pre-trained AlexNet and we tuned, uh, uh, trained the fully connected layers. And um, this we named as CON5T because the AlexNet has seven layers and we um, cut it down at the fifth layer and added the fully connected layers. These were the activation maps uh, at the last convolution layer. So you can see CON5 activation maps. Uh, so here at the last layer. Can you see any data? Can you see CNN learning any kind of data here? No. Then we cropped down the network to a lower value, which was at CON3 layer. We named it as CON3T. And in the activation maps, you can see there is some data, but still it is not enough to see the cell. Then we actually cropped it to one layer. So after one layer, we had fully connected uh, layers. And do you see the huge difference? You see all the 
um, different kinds of, I would say, features that we actually wanted to classify between them. And why it's happening is really important to understand is because in CNN, what happens is in the initial layers, uh, the features are more, um, mm, uh, you would say, lower level. So they would see, they would look at the edges or, uh, or texture, something like that. But when you go to the top layer, layer CN features, they are, and when you pass them on to the natural images, you will see that it is actually looking at a whole tire, for example, in a car. It is uh, looking at a whole door in the image of a house, for example. Uh, but the medical images, the microscopic images are so small, they don't have these higher level features in them. They only have the lower level textual features. And for that, the best one uh, in our theory should be the CON1 layer, which is th uh, there. And the results actually uh, uh, were saying that. So the orange bar here is uh, from CON1T, and you can see it is extremely, extremely higher than CON3T and CON5T. It was amazing to see that it was happening. Um, okay, and the, the final results. So the, with the proposed uh, CON1T uh, classification, we did two class classification only, and this was again on the her left data set that I showed you. You, what you can do is, you can take the data set, take different CNNs, and see what is the accuracy for yourself. Uh, it will be a really um, good starting point. Uh, so we had actually 99.3% accuracy, which was the uh, yeah, state of the art. Okay, and in the seven class classification, we had 93.75 accuracy, which is extremely, extremely close to the 93.78% accuracy, uh, which is the state of the art. Uh, and again, the benchmark. Uh, I hope you guys know what is benchmark in machine learning, but um, if not, I'll repeat. Uh, the benchmark is when uh, this is the baseline, you would say that this is the, you cannot get worse accuracy than this. This is the benchmark. This is the initial accuracy actually proposed by the people who uh, proposed the Herlev data set and they said we got 61.1%. Now, if you can do better than that, please do it. So that is the benchmark. And you should always look for it when you are performing classification and see if you are CNN or if anything else is doing better than that. Okay, so this was it for the overall, how can you do segmentation? How can you do classification? Now, um, I'm very close to the end and I am going to talk about a fully automated system which takes, which takes the uh, microscopic images and tells you if the um, cell is normal or abnormal. And actually it was, this whole system has already been deployed in a few hospitals in India and that's really good, really inspiring. Uh, okay, so this I would, yeah, okay. So for in the nuclei detection part of the system, of the overall system, so don't, don't pay attention to what is written after system, just pay attention to the system. So it is a whole system of cervical cancer analysis. So in that we did the nuclei detection and classification. So in the nuclei detection part, if we did uh, the algorithm one, which I showed you using mean shift or and something else which I would not mention. Uh, there is another kind of thing which can be done is that there is a very common thresholding called as CLAHE, which can be done. And after that, just a global thresholding. So the, if you see the difference between these two, the first one is more accurate, but definitely it needs more time. The second one is less less accurate, but it will take less time. 
so it depends on the people what they want to put out in the final um, um, model or final i would say system yeah so in this one actually the uh, second one was uh, put out in the final system because it is taking less time and that is what we want in the real time scenario uh, these were the actual sample images from I, I've written as uh, Iantra dataset. It was, uh, it is actually taken from a hospital in India. Uh, this is a normal cell on the left, then L cell is a lower grade, lower grade, um, uh, what is abnormality cancer and then H cell is higher grade cancer and SCC is the carcinoma which is the highest grade of cancer. Uh, so the nuclei detection was done on the original image. These are the normal nuclei detected. These are the abnormal nuclei detected below. Uh, and for the classification the CON1T architecture was used which was shown. And finally Finally, this is the final accuracy of the system that is in the market and uh, the training accuracy was 95.5% and validation was 95.7%, which is extremely high for medical data and for real-time data. Also, um, on this project, uh, people from IIT Kharagpur were working on the hardware side. We were working on the software side and Aindra was doing uh, also working on both the sides and doing uh, all the um, I would say collaborations and making it into a system. This was done by Indra at the end. Okay, uh, so we are at the end of uh, this and uh, I have shown you some medical applications using ML and Definitely, we looked at the cervical cancer screening in detail and how can you make a fully automated system and launch it in the um, world, basically. So, yeah, and um, I would like to acknowledge Aindra Systems for their continuous support in this. And thank you. I will take any questions now. Uh, thank you, Srishni. It was a very informative session. Uh, here in the chat section, we have actually two questions. One from Mr. Sachin. He is asking if there is a difference in contrast. Can we differentiate well, especially dark area and gray area? Uh, if, if there is a different in contrast, can we? Yeah, if there is actually a difference in contrast, uh, so the contrast actually means that, um, wait, I'll stop presenting for now. So the contrast actually means that um, you have uh, the lighter parts more lighter in the image, the darker parts more darker in the image. Um, so if there is a difference in the contrast, then this will be happening. This will be happening. And, oh. uh, I will put that question on better way. Sushte. Actually, uh, I just want to ask, like, see if there is two cells, one on the other. Yes. Uh, there may mm -hmm. be a case where, uh, you know, uh, the when you do the microscopy, you one cell may come on the other cell. It may not happen in the biological uh, systems or samples, but it will happen with the materials. So in that case, mm -hmm. there will be a little bit, only slight uh, contrast difference. So will that be differentiated? Yes, that's that? true. Yeah. So in that uh, case. Yeah, that depends. Actually. Yeah, in some scenarios, it is extremely difficult to um, differentiate in the contrast. It's extremely difficult, you're right. And, uh, but we can see if we can do anything. But yeah, I would say something, sometime it's uh, very different, very difficult, and then we do not do it. We just go through with the classification. We have to take the challenge as it is, that there, there can nothing be done. OK, thank you. Thanks for me. Uh, and I guess there is one more question. I think you want to know, is there any ML applications currently? Yeah. So any work going on with respect to the current pandemic situation? Uh, can you give any yes. comments? Yeah, uh, so very good question. Uh, I actually um, looked at it a few months back because I had to do uh, some 
thing um, uh, in the medical data and i looked for data for covid 19 and there is a uh, covid-19 data available uh, if you search for it there are x ray images available and there are ct scans available so many much research is going on uh, from the ml side there are numerous amounts of paper if you want to look at them but practically uh, nothing has been deployed yet because this is a very difficult problem you know but yeah theoretically many things are going on okay shrishti i have one query Uh, as you have told yes. that in medical images we need to target for uh, uh, true negative to be zero. Yeah. Correct. So, so how do we actually set? Does it like algorithm dependent? Uh, how do we actually make it to zero? Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you for the question. So, um, what we um, do is true negative and accuracy. All these are just at the end. the parameters of the model that we look for so when you train a cnn and you see that the uh, it is giving us accuracy and we uh, see okay we want we target the maximum accuracy but we also monitor we can also monitor the true negative value what is the true negative rate and we can set it as zero when it is zero and the accuracy is higher so this is a trade off and we have to manually uh, monitor it and then see it Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other queries from the participants? Okay, I guess uh, Srishti have answered all the queries from our participants. Thank you so much. Uh, in spite of your big busy schedule, you have taken time out for this workshop session. Uh, from on behalf of Dan and Sagar University, I would like to thank you for this wonderful and informative session, and all the best for your future endorsement. And we'll be looking forward to ha have more interaction with you in this domain, even in future also. Thank you so much. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, i would like to thank all our participants so we'll we'll have our next session tomorrow again at the same time 2 pm thank you everyone uh, we'll share the feedback link now uh, all i request all the participants just to wait for another 2 3 minutes i think she hello yeah uh, i think it, it was really a good opportunity for all of us uh, uh, to hear somebody who is actually doing research in cnn uh, with related to medical images and i'm sure that many of you must have learned or at least got some idea on how people work in medical domain so this must have united from the park and you to take up this and you know do your either uh, academic projects or probably take up your research in this domain and uh, uh, If not medical image, but the concepts which you have learned today might be also used in some other uh, engineering aspects also. So I'm sure this must be a learning point, and you have got a lot of pointers from the speaker, and I'm sure it it must help you in uh, you know building up your uh, uh, career in this domain. So I thank speaker one more uh, time, and uh, that that's all from my side. Uh, dear participants we have shared the feedback link in the chat section kindly fill the feedback form thank you everyone and uh, we are actually waiting for the day to materials we have to yet to receive it from the speaker as soon as we receive the materials for day 2 and day 3 we will be sharing with all our participants thank you <laughs>